So welcome, Wendy. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, I always like to just start by asking, well, how did you find Aikido? Oh, purely by accident. Um, I was uh, working in a health food restaurant in Puerto Madera, California, and um, I was a waitress and everybody started hustling to get the restaurant closed up. And I said, what are we hustling for? And they said, oh, we're going to a, an Aikido class. You should come. And I thought, okay. So, um, you know, this van pulls up and it was like a Cheech and Chong movie. They opened the door of this Volkswagen bus and smoke just billowed out of it. And um, I got in the bus and we drove to the Unitarian Church and I saw my first Aikido class. And um, of course we were in altered states and uh, I, I fell in love, but it, doesn't, it wasn't a cognitive, I'm going to do Aikido thing at all. So right. that's why I got connected. So do you remember who was teaching that class? Nado Sensei, of course. So is that where you stayed, presumably? The, the state of mind was appropriate then. Very much so. Um, yeah, no, I just kept going. And we get when the van wasn't going in, I would hitchhike in. And um, yeah, I used to have to wash my feet in the sink because I didn't wear shoes at that point. And, the mat, and I remember the mats were those blue and yellow gymnastics mats. And when you were high, they would go like this, whoa, 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 whoa. Set off this energy, be like, whoa, this is really something. So what was so, it about the Aikido that appealed? Oh, see, I grew up riding horses and there was something about managing a power that's much bigger than you are with love and grace. Right. And there's a little girl riding horses, that was always the goal. Um, and so Aikido was like that, it was like, how do you manage this power bigger than you are with love, with grace, um, with ener energy? And it was so energetic. And uh, when you're a small uh, girl, <laughs> you're managing a big horse, it's the same deal. You need that, you need that flow, that energy to do it properly because you can't muscle the horse. <clears throat> so did it immediately impact on your horse riding? Did, could you see the connection straight away? And oh, I, wasn't, I wasn't riding horses at that point. I rode horses through my... Um, early life. And then by that time I was, um, I was a hippie and I couldn't yeah, do the horse thing. I was basically living in my car, I think. <laughs> so, so, so how did that journey progress? I mean, so you obviously you stuck with Aikido through thick and thin. I wasn't sure whether you found the embodiment at the same time or, or afterwards. So yeah, doing Aikido for a number of years. And then um, people used to say, uh, you're a really good teacher. And I'd be, uh, you know, I was always in, in that state um, of having partaken before a class. And I would say, yeah, I don't know what you're smoking, but I don't teach. I play music. Um, I'm, I'm not a teacher. And yet they kept saying it. And then uh, finally, George Leonard said, I will, um, if you come to Esalen and teach with me, I'll pay you. And I was like, pay me, woo. So um, I went down and, and people, would say, you know, you're a good teacher. I, it never occurred to me. And then Helen Palmer, the Enneagram lady, she also came, said the same thing. And she said, I'll set you up with a class of my students. And I want you to teach us this thing you do, which I didn't know what I did, to be honest with you. Uh, but they didn't want to do formal Aikido. They just wanted the energetics. So I started developing a process from it. And then one thing led to another and it developed, it's, it kept developing itself. But it was even writing books. I, I said, I don't write books. George writes books, Richard writes books, but someone in my class had a publishing um, house and she said, I want you to write this book. And I said, I don't write. And she said, why don't you write? And I said, because I can't spell because I grew up in the fifties and I'm dyslexic. And so my papers were always covered with red. So if you couldn't spell, you couldn't write. Yeah. And, and she said, well, that's just ridiculous. You can, so um, she said, we'll tape you. So they taped me and they said, now read it and edit it. And I said, okay. And then I did that. And they said, now write a little intro to the chapter. And they said, now write the damn book. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I was always resistant. It never, it was never anything like I want to do this. It just kept, something kept pushing me and I'm very grateful for it, but that's how it all occurred. And I developed this process and it kept developing and, as you know, now it's kind of all over the place and we work mostly in organizations and I'm grateful. 
So how many years in was it before you wrote the first book? Well, I started in 71 and my first book came out in 94. Right. So, uh, and was the book based on just your, uh, what you discovered as sort of enhancements of what you'd learned at the Esalen School or, or, or what was the inspiration for it? Uh, well, you know, I was teaching these classes and people kept saying, you need to write this. And I'd say, well, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist. And I'd say, look, the Tibetan guys have written all this down already. And like Trungpa Rinpoche, my teacher, they've, they've written it better than I ever could. And, and people would say, no, no, you, we like your version. And I'm like, but my version is not good. Their version is good. And um, so it was, um, you know, really people asking me to, to write about my thoughts about it. And, you know, I, Neto was very inspirational, but um, I, I, you know, I took enough mind altering substances that I had very um, consistent universal experiences. So I was always interested in how do I bring those universal experiences that I had and make them accessible to people in everyday life. And it's the same with my formal Aikido. It's like, I do Aiki heresy, I call it. I tell people don't get grounded, lighten up. I tell people blending is overrated. You don't blend because blending implies we're separate and we have to get together. And my theory is we're already together. We should act as if we're together and not blend. We should just be together. Um, and then I tell people don't focus on UK, okay, focus on the space. So those are all kind of, I call them Aiki heresy views because most people are connect with your UK and then redirect your UK and you know, manage your UK. And I'm like, I'm not interested in managing my UK. I'm interested in managing myself, which is enough and, mm. and very difficult <laughs> to do. I always think it, it, it's, it's very helpful if somebody gives you an alternative way of looking at a subject. Sometimes that's what it takes to unlock the key. So I think that's- Well, well you know, I had many teachers. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time. So Nato was, the primary influence, um, Terry Dobson was an influence, um, Steve Seagal was an influence. They all came and to um, our dojo and taught and I hung out with them. Um, I was blown out by Lorraine Deanne when I first met her. Whoa, she had some power that was unbelievable. Um, and I was always interested in how these people manifested their power in ways that were benevolent. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I was very, you know, there was a, I, I studied with a lot of different people and I learned what not to do. There were some teachers that was like, okay, well, that's good. That's what I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And then there were other teachers that were very influential that were like, the, they, they gave me a glimpse of something that I wanted to unpack further. Mm. So you came to Aikido as a little bit of a hippie or maybe a bit bit of hippie. By, by using your words. Major, a, ma a major hippie. I was majoring in hippiness. So, so was that helpful? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm um, very much so because I, I could see trailers when people would throw. I remember one thing where early on, um, we used to bow into stacked chairs in the corner because Nato never brought a picture of O Sensei. Duran Sensei was the first person to bring a picture of O Sensei, and he placed it in the stacked chairs in the Unitarian Church Chapel. And I said, who's that? And Grand Sensei looked at me like, what do you mean, who's that? And he said, it's the founder of Aikido. And I said, I've dreamt about him. And I realized that I had two or three dreams about O Sensei before I ever saw the picture. And um, so I was training with George Leonard. And he, some of you know, he was extremely tall. And, um, and Nato did this thing, a little cokey throw, just like a, mm, with his hand, like one would do. And um, George grabbed me and I went like that with my hand. I was, I was pretty altered, mind altered at the time. And George flew across the room and landed in the chairs. And I remember looking at my hand thinking, far out. And <laughs> Neto, since it came by and he was like, huh. <laughs> George picked himself up, he was fine. But some of those moments and seeing people do these gestures and watching the tracers move across the room, I had such a deep feeling for the energetics of it. Right. And so the energetics, I think, really served me rather than th the technique. And then later I fell in love with the lines of Aikido. They're just so beautiful, the beauty of it. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that being in altered state was very, very helpful in the beginning. And then finally, I got some feedback that I should knock it off. <laughs> so, so the energetic side obviously stuck. What were the bits that maybe were a bit of a hindrance and you decided in the end that maybe you would knock it off? Um, I, I, uh, well, because I, I've got people said, you know, you shouldn't take acid and come to train. And I'm like, how do you know I'm on acid? <laughs> and they were like, uh, it's obvious. So um, I, I feel like there were times in which the energy was, would come through me and it wasn't in control and, and I didn't want to hurt anybody inadvertently. And then, um, and the other part is that I couldn't always concentrate on the forms. Right. And I realized at a certain point as I was starting to develop, you know, the forms were important and I needed to be able to manage the forms um, as well. And so, so that was another key. It's like, okay, you need to, I used to play jazz and, you know, you need your scales, you need to have your basics down and then you can improvise. So I kind of started imp with, impro with improvising and then I had to go back and sort of get my basics as was. And I realized I needed to do that if I wanted to keep developing in the art. Right. Uh, and so the embodiment journey, was that, uh, in its origins, was that inspired by Aikido or a completely separate movement in its own right? Well, two, two things. I mean, I, I, I was fortunate. I, I did quite well in Aikido quite early on. And I could handle like 200 pound guys quite easily, but I'd go home and my 30 pounder would get me off center like that, my daughter. And um, also I was a um, long-term meditator and I was having doing 10 day retreats and having really remarkable experiences on my Zafu, but I'd get off my Zafu and go into my kitchen and lose it. And so I wanted to find a way to take the principles of what we now call mindfulness um, and Aikido off the mat into my everyday life. Right. And then later, because it started making a profound difference for me in a positive way, I wanted to start to share them with other people. Uh, because I think Aikido and mindfulness offer uh, tremendous um, support for people who want to develop their spiritual lives and be less hung up with their neurosis. Uh, and so that's been my goal, was how do I take these principles and make them accessible? Working in organizations has been fun because we worked a lot with tech and engineers. And you have to make it really, they're not interested in any kind of thing, spiritual thing at all. It, you have to kind of infiltrate the spirituality in there. But I always found it interesting to try to make it, uh, the practices accessible to them. The practices of a circle, how to include others, um, a triangle, how to put something out into the world, Ike, um, things like that. Um, how to connect to letting something come through you instead of trying to self-generate it from inside of you. Because that's my big thing is I don't do it, it comes through being in the flow state. How to turn people on to, uh, how to invite the flow state to come through them, details like that. So I think it was, I think the embodiment part really had to do with how do I take these principles? And because most people in the world aren't going to train formal Aikido. And yeah. a lot of people aren't going to sit on a cushion an hour a day and do um, retreats. And the principles are so valuable for um, human development and connecting to our potential. Yeah. Uh, for me, there are, there are two sides of the same coin. Within Aikido are all the things that you do in embodiment and within embodiment you can borrow so much from Aikido as it is that it's, it's different expression of the same principles and that's why what your work is so valuable you found a, a brilliant way of taking it out into the world oh thank you <laughs> my pleasure but what I what I what I, what I was trying to ask was was the embodiment movement not when you found it was it already existing and thriving and had nothing to do with Aikido or did someone like George Leonard come along and do what you've kind of done. Take what he found on the mat and, and, and uh, produced a somatic movement. Well, I think George and Richard and myself all have our foundations of our work in Nato Sensei's work. I, I, and I think a number of people would acknowledge that, the Aikido people um, who brought it. And there was an embodiment movement, but it was dance and body work. 
Um, you know, Anna Halpern was doing phenomenal things and there was all the amazing bodywork people, Rolf, Fritz, um, Ida, uh, Feldenkrais, all of that. So that's all, you know, uh, embodiment and that, that was all going on and that was great. But my interest is how do you work these principles in what Aikido offers, which is what I call low grade threat. Yeah. Because most of the other embodiment environments are very supportive. In fact, they, they focus on being supportive. And in Aikido, you're dealing with low grade threat, which translates in the world as emails, voicemails, your own mind, your relationships with your families and so on. Um, and that's why I think the bit that we brought, um, and I it credit Nato Sensei, and Nato Sensei, I don't know if he ever did, but I hope he does, uh, is credit Tohei Sensei, because Tohei Sensei is where Nato Sensei got it from. And then Nato Sensei developed it. And then we took from Nato and we developed it in different ways for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But really, if you want to go to the heart of it, it was Koichi Tohei Sensei. He was the first person who brought O Sensei's teaching to the West and made it accessible and talked about energy and key and I in workshops I took from him he used to say we do key exercises so the ladies with the puffy hair and the long fingernails can practice <laughs> so um so that's the lineage as far as I see it and I see a, a direct separation between the kind of embodiment that is creates a very safe quote supportive uh, supportive environment and the kind of, kind of embodiment that offers challenges for people so that they can um, deal with their aggression and their fear and their reactiveness rather than soothe it. We're not trying to soothe it. We're trying to confront it. It's yeah. masukatsu asukatsu, you know, true victory is victory over yourself. Yeah. Um, so that's the, I, that's the distinction that I make. No, oh, that's really, really helpful and really interesting to me because I started in and key Aikido and that's why I found such a, an easy affinity with the sort of work that you do because it, I could see directly the parallels and understand where it was coming from. Uh, so thank you for that. S so how did it start to take off big time then? How did, how did you, you've ended up with this massive organization really, or a very successful organization at least. Well, it's not massive, that's for sure. There's like three of us, but well, we have a lot of associates, you're correct with that. Um, I, you know, Quentin, I don't know the answer to that because the whole thing has been so mysterious to me. As I said, I thought I was going to smoke pot and play music for the rest of my life. It never occurred to me that I would, that this would be what it is. But, um, you know, I think it started with George Leonard and Helen Palmer were the two people who really started pushing me and they were in the world and they had students and they had organizations and they kept saying to me, you have this thing and you need to share it. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I remember I've been teaching workshops for about 10 years and someone introduced me as someone who'd been teaching for 10 years. And I had this epiphany. I thought, oh, this is my main practice, what I do. And I do music on the side. Like I'd always still had this vision that I was <laughs> playing music and that I was doing that on the side. And I realized that my calling was actually this. And it was like, oh, so that just shows you it was a 10 year delay before I was like, huh. And then, um, I don't know, people would come to the workshops and occasionally they'd have an organization and they'd say, will you come in and do something? And then um, there was a coach and she brought me into a biotech organization and I coached someone there and then it spread in the organization and then they left and they went to Salesforce and it spread there and then we went Oracle and they took us there. And then, you know, so um, it, it's sort of people started um, that had the experience in an organization and they'd often go to another organization and they'd say, will you come in and work with that? So that's a little bit how the organization thing developed. Mm. Um, in terms of being global, I would get invited um, to places. And I would just go even if there was almost no money in it. Um, so South Africa, for instance, you know, was just a love of mine. I'd already been 1989 and then invited to go back in 2006. And I fell in love with it and started going regularly. And then some people read my book, uh, New Ventures West, um, always put it on their required reading list. And so coaches would then invite me. It's a little bit how I got to India and Singapore. Um, so it was kind of through that. And, and because I would go and not, not uh, charge a lot of money, I went all over the world pretty much and 
and there were people. And so, because, you know, if you want to make money, it's in organizations. It's not doing workshops for people who are paying out of their own pocket. That's not, I, I, I want that to be really reasonable for people. Yeah. So, um, so, so how, I don't know. Yeah. Are you still really, really busy with it? Or are you trying to pass it on to your daughter and take a little bit more of a back seat these days? Well, my daughter is my partner and she's really good um, from a point of view of, you know, the joke is I make this stuff up and she organizes it. So she just has, you know, she can really create presentations and papers and all of this. And um, she's turned out to be a wonderful presenter and a wonderful coach. Uh, and really, you know, growing herself um, that way. So we're really in a good partnership. Um, I, before COVID, I was traveling on an average of 150,000 miles a year for oh, like six yes. years. I know. And my joke is I was thinking of cutting back a little bit, but I said to the universe, I didn't mean like totally stop. <laughs> um, so we haven't been as busy, but we've been, we've kept busy. We've got a couple of organizations that uh, we work with their teams. Um, of course, you know, we do it virtually. Um, and we'll probably go back um, and do some in-person work. A lot of the organizations now, though, are changing. Um, you've probably read it if you've looked at it at all, but a lot of people don't want to go back and work in person. They want to stay virtual, especially tech um, engineers. They, they don't feel the need to be in a room, sit with other people. Um, and so, and they're also like, I don't want to do a two and a half hour commute a day. Um, they've adjusted to being home. So, <clears throat> so that'll change, but I, and I think we will probably continue to do a combination of online and in-person mm. also because if we're delivering to a larger organization, you know, we can't go and work with everybody there. We can only work with the senior leadership teams. Um, so how's the pandemic experience been for you? Because in many ways, whilst there are lots of awful things about it, it's produced some really positive results as far as, for me personally, uh, you know, this community is um, a, a result of that. Learning that you can actually main, maintain some sort of Aikido journey online has been a revelation. How's it been for you? Yes, well, in terms of Aikido, it's been really interesting because <clears throat> I started, I think, was it the end of March or April doing online classes once a week? And Greg posts them on our, uh, puts them on Facebook. Um, and so, you know, at first it was like, I looked up all the old sensei quotes and I kind of went into my thing. And then, you know, a few months in, I'm like, okay, now you're gonna have to start to, <laughs> like you've done that, been there, done that. Um, so I would ask people, we have a little core group and um, some others dip in from here. And then I'd say, send me your thoughts or ideas or questions. And then, you know, I started having to do research and like look online and look up stuff and look, watch videos and think about things because the format is we do warm ups. Um, I read something that I've been researching, like a, a view of something. Um, we have a little talk, then we do some exercise, usually key exercises that have to do with that. And then we, we talk some more and then we have a little bouquet ritual we do in the end. So um, it's really made me work. Uh, to, and be very, you know, keep looking more deeply into what are these elements of Aikido, everything from how do you strike? How do you grab? Like what, it, you can look at it quite deeply actually, just a, a hold or a movement. Uh, where does it come from? Where does it start? Where does it go to? Um, how do you bring it through you? Uh, who do you use as inspiration? Uh, what does it feel like as it moves through your body? Um, I've been working a lot on concentration, really encouraging people to practice like just doing a gesture, but then find a point way out and concentrate to it. And you know, imagine you're pulling it from the earth and inviting it from the sky and from behind you and really connect way out as a way for people to start to um, grow their capacity for extension and also focus, you know, find that point, stay with that point uh, because Key is like light, it's very nice, but when it's focused, light is a laser. And so, you know, the theme a lot through the months have been, how do we keep growing and cultivating our capacity to focus our key, to let it come through us, um, 
to be able to imagine further and further out, um, that kind of thing. So it's been a, um, that wouldn't have happened at that level had it not been through, oh, sorry. Um, had, it, had it not been through, uh, you know, having to do weekly online classes, which I would complain about, but I've, it's helped me grow a lot. Sorted. Sorted. Managed to sort that out, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, good. Marvellous. So, so more positive than negative for you personally? I mean, also, it, it made you slow down, I imagine. Well, yes. I mean, I had an interesting thing happen because uh, we sold our houses last, what was it? Um, Uh, last spring, oh no, a year ago last spring. And then we moved up here and we moved into this rental. And <laughs> I've been 10 years living alone in my own bathroom. I was in a house sharing a bathroom with two teenagers, a dog and a cat. <laughs> we were all squished into this rental together. Um, and it was, uh, you know, kind of, a, well, we came up in the summer and then it became winter and it was kind of dark and the house didn't have a lot of windows. and everybody got really, really struggled with it. And, you know, I'm a long-term um, meditative practitioner. And I actually, it forced me to up my spiritual practice tremendously and to up my level of compassion because I was so irritated so much of the time. There's a thing called Tonglen in Tibetan Buddhism where you breathe in the negativity and you breathe out the positivity. Mm. You breathe in your irritation, you breathe out compassion. Man, did I do a lot of that. <laughs> but it was, it's been great for me. It's really, um, it really pushed me to up my spiritual practice because if not, I was going to end up just being really frustrated and irritated like everyone else. And I didn't want to add to that. And, you know, I'm older. I've been at this a long time. And I thought, I just don't need to, you know, to make it worse. I can work on some equanimity and some um, compassion. So, um, so it's been really good for me in terms of pushing me because when I'm traveling as much, I always do a practice. Um, when I'm traveling, I always I have a whole ritual that I do, whether I'm in hotel rooms or wherever. Um, but this was like, all right, up it even further. So yes, I slowed down in some ways in terms of not traveling or working as much, but I felt like um, my life intensified in terms of working with my uh, ego and my reactiveness. Very cool. So where did the Buddhist influence come from? Um, well, I was always interested in it, which, you know, I grew up in a Midwestern town and there was nothing like that. But when I was nine, I asked my father for a book on Buddhism. And, uh, and you know, I loved the idea. I, ha I had a very unhappy childhood. So the first noble truth, all is suffering. I was like, right on, Buddha. <laughs> um, and... Uh, but there wasn't much around. And then I got involved in Christian science, which is fascist Buddhism, actually, um, when I was about 11 or 12, which was really cool. And then I fell out of it because there's a really dark side to Christian science as well, but it's very similar. It says matter is error, where Buddhists say matter is an illusion. Um, it talks about mind with a big M and a little M and self with a big S and a little S. And um, th th there's a lot of similarities in a, in a funny kind of way. Um, but they're heavy handed about how you mustn't do this or that. Tibetan Buddhism is much more relaxed and easy and the lamas are pretty, you know, pretty easygoing and cool and very devoted at the same time. Um, so then I fell out of that. And then when I was in high school and college, I got into existentialism and that seemed right because again, I had a sort of dark negative attitude. Um, and then um, when I was in California, um, 69, I read Autobiography of a Yogi and I started doing the Self-Realization Fellowship Correspondence Course. <clears throat> so I was meditating in a certain way, but not particularly focused on Buddhists. And then um, I don't remember the year, 79, something like that. Um, a Zen guy who was a Japanese man, who was a dear friend, um, said, I want to take you to see somebody. I went, okay, okay, I'm happy to go see him. So we... Um, got in the car, we went to the Unitarian church um, where I've been doing Aikido and I saw Trungpa Rinpoche for the first time. 
And I felt like my light just went like this. <laughs> just everything he said and who he was in his presence. So I started getting involved in that. And then later I started doing 10 day Vipassana retreats. Um, <clears throat> but I think it was, you know, I'd always been interested in this stuff and looked for different ways um, because I'd always thought this life sucks um, and people are unhappy and um, there has to be something more than money and power. Cause I grew up around a lot of people who had money and power and they were all miserable. So I was like, yeah, that's not it. Stuff, money, power is obviously not the answer but I didn't know where it was. And I felt like, <clears throat> you know, Tibetan Buddhism and Trungpa Rinpoche have been like the, the clearest avenue um, for me. So it, it was, again, it was just something that kind of unfolded but it was a, 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 always a seeking that there has to be something more than what Western culture points to as success. <laughs> so does, does yoga get tied into all of that? What do you mean by yoga? Well, do you, yoga practice, is that part of what you do? You mean like, you mean like asanas? Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> because you know, the um, Theravada Buddhists call themselves yogis and say they do yoga, it's meditation. They don't do physical movements. Now, I, I, I don't do a lot of yoga. I've taken a bunch of yoga classes. I have a little stretching ritual that I do. I have so many Aikido injuries, well, and horse injuries that I have to work around myself. So I don't do as traditional, but I do some traditional things and I do regular stretching. I have to because of <clears throat> my body and what it's been through, it needs to be. So have you been lucky enough to take yourself to Tibet yet? Yes, I went around Mount Kailash. Um, and it was beautiful, but it was very sad and depressing being in Tibet, except around Kailash. Do you know what Kailash is? No, tell us, please. Okay, so um, it's not in the Himalayan chain, it's further um, west. And it's called Mount Kailash or Mount Meru, and it's considered by most religions to be the center of the universe. It's where all the great rivers in Tibet, uh, in, in um, Asia, are supposed to originate there. And no one's ever climbed it. Um, you circumambulate it for its blessings. And so the Buddhist, the Bon, the Hindu, um, and, and so on, all believe that it's, if you go around it, it gives you blessings and helps to purify you. Uh, so I went and the high pass is 18,700 feet. So it was up there. So I did go around that, but I was very sad being in most of Tibet. I had to do a lot of that Tonglen because the Chinese have trashed it. And and the Tibetans that I was with, that were uh, they were so afraid, and it was scary every time we'd come into a little town, and it was it was it was it's very sad. Then um, some years later, I took a, a, some people to Bhutan, and that really healed me because I'm a Vajrayana Buddhist, uh, an aspect of Tibetan Buddhism, and that's the main thing there. Padmasambhava, who's the patron saint, and Bhutan, they look after all their. Um, monasteries and they look after all their temples and everything so cared for in the Tibetan Buddhist point of view that it was very healing to go to Bhutan and and see how nicely supported that aspect is. So if I'm feeling your life was a pile of shit really have you come around to the view that maybe there's there's something worth having here? Here? Yeah, on the planet so life is a, a happy place and a more meaningful thing now than it was when you were a young girl? Well, you know, it's not about happiness. It's about freedom. Right. That's, that's the Buddhist thing. Buddhist thing is not about happiness. That just kind of got weird and deluded. Because if you're happy, then what happens if you get unhappy? Then, you know, then you're suffering because you don't want to be unhappy. You want to be happy. Um, but to be free from need and greed, to be free from wanting stuff, yep. and to be able to accept impermanence and loss. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have this really cool app, which I recommend to everyone. It's called We Croak. It's 99 cents, it's got a frog on it. And it says that when you open it, it says, in Bhutan, they say, thinking about death five times a day brings happiness. And then they send you five quotes a day, just random quotes. And, um, and it does, because I, I get this thing on my phone and it was, remember, you're going to die. And I'm like, right. So appreciate this moment. So it brings me back into the moment and makes me appreciate the moment. And um, 
And then I have, we have a centering app for a leadership embodiment. And I have that set to ping me a bunch of times during the day. So when my phone goes, I'm like, oh, either center or it's time to die. Either way, get here for this. <laughs> Be present in this moment. Um, so I think the idea is to continue to wake up and remember um, there's this moment and, um, you know, from a samurai point of view, we're judged by how we die, which is why they have the death haikus. Like if you're whining, you go to the land of the whiners. Um, if you're compassionate, you go to the land of compassionate people. And so since I don't know actually what will happen, I figure practice up just in case. <laughs> They're right. It's been my philosophy for life, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I like to practice up and um, remember when I'm freaking out or I'm irritated or I, it's like, it really, you know, if I die in this next 30 seconds, is that really how I want to be? Uh, and the answer is no, just in case. I don't want to go to the land of the people who are annoyed. I want to go to a place where there's compassion and um, warmth and light and so on. That's so um, a really nice. Our, our tagline for leadership embodiment is noble, awesome, shiny. And I, the Aikido people know it too. And it comes from um, years ago, I took a seminar with Satomi Sensei and uh, he had this beautiful flowing technique, very powerful and very, and he demonstrated and asked us to practice and we stood up to practice and a few seconds later he claps, no, 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 you so stiff. So then he showed it again. This is what I'm looking for. And then we stood up to practice and he claps after he goes, now nah, you all look sloppy and spaced out. And um, he closed his eyes and he was trying to find the words. And he said, I want to see your noble. I want to see your awesome. I want to see your shiny. And I thought, oh, I love that. So noble is the uplifted quality of posture. Awesome is the expansiveness because we really work on just opening and expanding all the time. And shiny is the warmth, mm. is the light that we can bring through us. Nice. So, you know, I think that's really the goal is to cultivate as much naz, we call it naz as possible, on the mat, off the mat. Sounds like a good plan. So I think that segues quite neatly into your foundation work in South Africa. Would you like to talk about that? The, the, talk about, what? say it well, again, the foundation. Yeah, the foundation work in South Africa. You, you don't do that. You do that because it's something that really inspires you and you feel they need it. And it's a, it seems to me it's a giving back project. So there's two things that went on in South Africa with a foundation, which we don't um, we don't have anymore. But when I was doing the foundation work, it was absolutely we got some money from the Fetzer Institute to be able to bring these practices and make them accessible to people in the townships, which are the slums of South Africa, and also um, some work with Ethiopia, hmm. the young people in Ethiopia. And that's, you know, always if we can help them, um, we want to help them for sure. Um, and then I have a place in South Africa and I go and used to do a lot of courses and trainings. And, you know, sadly, those are mostly white people. We have some Indian uh, people and so on, but the people who could afford to do those kind of things um, are white people. And so we wanted to be able to offer it more to people of color. And so we did some of that. Um, but, you know, it's such a huge project and they don't, even for them to get the time to come and do a workshop, even if you offer it for free, mm. um, that's not always easy. Uh, so, um, We've done it, I would do it again if I had the opportunity, but there's a lot that needs to get into place to set that kind of thing up. It's not as easy as it seems. And, you know, it's like, there's such a great need. But what I learned is that you really have to understand the culture and the people. You can't just go in with your little California whiteness and go, oh, I wanna help. And here's some things. It's, there's a lot more going on um, when you're bringing when you're trying to support and aid people who are struggling in their lives just to get the basics of their lives, just to get food and water. And, you know, the woman would say that she, they didn't have electricity would go out. It was rare to have electricity in her shack and she had a candle and then her son took the candle. So she had to sit in the dark. I mean, seriously, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's hard to, 
And then let me bring you practices to center and be shiny. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's well, tricky. It turns out to be tricky. Sure. Well, how did you bridge it? Um, well, we connected to an organization that <clears throat> was working mostly with women. Um, and that organization was offering them some training. So there's these big stores in South Africa and they throw a lot of stuff away. It's like the equivalent of Macy's or Target, whatever. And these women would go and collect that stuff. Um, and then they would bring women in from the, from the townships and they would say, we will train you to resell this, but you have to take these courses. So we partnered with people like that who knew what they were doing, who were already, who'd, who'd been at it a long time and who understood it. Right. So presumably now there are people that were trained up by you and your team out there carrying on that work? Some, yes, some. But, you know, in a place like South Africa, it's just, it's hard to, like, if you've been to India and the slums, it's almost unfathomable. Um, the amount, you know, you see these slums that go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And um, it's such a huge thing. It's a little bit um, overwhelming. But yes, we did, you know, do our little bit like when I worked in the prisons, the prison system is such a basket case, but did our little bit to try to support inmates and staff. Is that know, what to continues? Um, I don't know if it continues. I mean, that was 90 to 97. That was a long time ago. And some people did take it over and I haven't really followed what they've done. But there's a lot of good work being done by some sanghas, some Buddhist sanghas in prisons, which is nice, mostly meditation. I was trying to bring them more energetic work. Oh, <laughs> I was working in the prison. We were working in a women's federal prison and I was doing some energy work, walking back and forth, like walking, making a triangle and stepping back, making a circle, you know, receiving the energy. And then, and this woman came up to me, she was an Asian woman. And she said, uh, huh, this is a lot like something I used to do when I was in Japan. There was a guy named, what was his name? Uh, I think it was Oishiba. And I said, you studied with O sensei? She said, oh yeah. She said, I wasn't very good at Aikido, but he loved to pray. So I would go and pray with him at the temples. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that was really quite, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, life is such a mystery, how people get where they are and who we meet. Wow. So do you have any, uh, where would you like things to travel from here in terms of the work you're doing? Uh, you know, that's hard to say, Quentin, because I, um, I mean, my daughter is much more, she's working with another woman and they're getting a little bit of vision of how to go forward. Um, I've never been good at visioning. And, you know, the whole thing has happened so spontaneously to me and I continue to be so surprised by it. Mm -hmm. And um, people say, well, where do you wanna be in two years or five years? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just want the universe to um, point us where we're supposed to go right. and we'll do the best we can. Um, certainly, um, there's the possibility we could spread it more within organizations, which is which is a really good thing because people in organizations have a lot of influence on our culture. Not, you know, the organizations have influence on our culture and then there's people in organizations. So if we can bring some NAS to those people and help them develop their compassion and their, um, their wisdom, uh, that will be good, I think, for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know when we'll get back to in-person work in terms of workshops and courses. Um, I'd love to go back to Europe. Um, I was going to go to Romania, which is one place I'd never been and do some work there before this and see Dracula's castle, woo. But um, that fell through. Um, but maybe when all this settles down, we could go back and I wouldn't, I don't think I'll go as much as I used to, to be honest with you. But I do. I, I would like to go to Europe like twice a year, maybe Asia once a year, something like that. Mm. Okay. And Aikido of Tamil Pace is quite a long way from where you live now. Any desire to open up a dojo a little closer to home? No, no, not at all. I go down once a month. I fly down. I just came back. I teach two classes. I see my son and his family because they're down there and we have a day. And then I teach two classes. And we just had a 
a down test for a young man. He'd been practicing since he was seven. He's 18. He's going off to college. It was a fabulous test. He had such a presence. It was lovely. Um, so trying to build the energy back up in the dojo again. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, was it last month, we went down at our first in-person class. We were holding each other and rolling on the mat. We were really emotional. It was just like, uh, to get back to that was incredible. Um, so I'm trying to support that and keep that going. And um, yeah, I have no plans for up here at this point, but you know, it's a mystery. And we always joke in the leadership embodiment, we would say the, uh, the recommend recommended dose would be 50% mastery and 50% mystery. Because you know the culture is kind of like ninety percent mastery and ten percent mystery, mm -hmm. and after COVID, it's been like eighty-five percent mystery. <laughs> so, well, universe had to get used to mystery. So that's it's all a mystery in terms of where I'll go or what'll happen for me with Aikido or any of it. So, when you think about um, you know, all the people you've worked with, is do you have a favorite story for how? You met this person, whoever it may be, you don't have to say any names. You did the work and it, it really made such a difference to the way an organization worked or how, how they worked. Are you talking about Aikido or? Well, it, Aikido and in, in, in uh, your leadership embodiment work. I was thinking more of the latter, really. The leadership embodiment work? Yeah. Good question. Um, I mean, there've been a number of people that I've had really interesting conversations with. Um, and, you know, there've been some leaders that I've worked with that um, I had this moment, I thought, oh, that's, that, has, that leader has a lot of naz and they're influencing their part of the organization in a positive way. Uh, I've also met leaders that I think, oh, not so much. Um, that's not, uh, and, and, and what's sad about that is that often the rhetoric is inclusion and that sense of support and appreciation. And it's, it's not so much that way. Um, but, you know, sadly, there's not that many leaders in organizations. And, and I think the reason is because the leaders in organizations, I mean, I, they work 10 hours a day in meetings. Um, they, most of them try to squeeze in some time to exercise. Um, mindfulness is big in organizations now. And if people can get five or 10 minutes, <clears throat> that's a lot. We work with this one organization and they have like 20 minute calls because they don't have time for more. And I think <clears throat> that's one of the issues is that one of the things that we offer in the leadership embodiment is we have a 20 second centering a five second centering and a one second centering. And it works for people in organizations because they don't feel they have 10 minutes. They don't feel they have five minutes. They, they, don't, want to, they don't feel they can take that time. Yeah. Um, it's very stressful and competitive and there's so much going on. Organizations move so, the big organizations, so global and move so fast. Um, and that comes from Aikido where you don't have 10 minutes to get yourself together on the mat. You know, you're lucky if you have five seconds to get yourself, you know, rebalanced and reorganized yeah. um, for the next attack. And so I thought, well, that's perfect for businesses. But I haven't really met any business leaders that I've thought, I mean, the one who, who I love and I wouldn't want to be in relationship with him or work with him is Elon Musk. Right. And he's South African too. I just love that he's fearless and he's so willing to fail. Um, and he's not as much of a, negative person as Steve Jobs was mean to people. Elon's not particularly mean to them. He's just like, look, you know, he works people to death and people say, well, that's horrible. And he goes, but if they don't like it, they can go to Apple. He goes, I'm not, they're choosing to be here and they're young. And if they want to work 16 hour days and his whole thing is that's what you have to do if you want to succeed at the level. Um, but I, I admire and respect him because of his fearlessness and the fact that he just doesn't give up and everybody says he couldn't do what he did and he continues to do it. And he's a crazy person who, but he's the first to admit it. You know, he goes like, I'm not a regular, you can't expect me to be a regular person because I couldn't develop SpaceX and Tesla and do all that stuff I do if I was a regular person. Um, 
but I, th those kind of people, when I'm feeling like I can't do it or oh, it's not worth it or I get that sort of down thing, I think of Elon and I think, oh, come on, Wendy, you can't be Elon, but you could get a little, you could bring a little of that energy. Mm. You know, he's very um, optimistic and I'm a pessimist by nature. I have a very dark um, personality mm. and I've struggled with it my whole life. It's one of the reasons I work so hard. Um, and he's such an optimist that um, it helps me when I think about him, I think, oh, come on, just pull a little of Elon's energy through and stop being so pessimistic. You don't strike me as a pessimist. I work very hard not to be, but people who know me really well are like, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's, it's actually been a doorway because um, in leadership embodiment as in Aikido, my theory is I cannot do it from inside myself. It's impossible. I just do not have the inner resources to manage a guy who's twice my size and half my age. And, and I'm a doubter by nature. I always think it won't work, I can't do it. And so what I do is I have my, some of you know, my posse, I call it, which is the inspirational characters. And the famous ones are um, Dalai Lama when my mind needs expansion, when my mind feels tight and limited, when I need compassion, which is most of the time because I'm Irish and really judgmental. Um, I think of Mother Teresa and I feel a little bit of compassion. And when I need confidence, I think of O Sensei. And so when things happen, like my favorite story is that I got a phone call and someone said, this was quite a few years ago, would you be willing to come and work with some young leaders at NASA? NASA, how cool is that, right? So the first thing that went through my mind is I can't do it. I don't have the credentials. And then I thought, oh, they can do it. So I summoned my posse and I was able to say, I'd be delighted, let's talk about details. And then I hung up and I thought, I can't do it. I don't have the credentials. So I had to keep working with myself um, as a way to kind of summon these qualities, which I, as I, if I think of them as outside of me and I invite them to come through me, then I can be more noble, awesome and shiny. But when I start relating to me, Wendy, the personality, it gets very unpleasant and dark. I, I have a lot of um, guilt, shame, self-loathing um, and stuff like that, which I think everyone has their fair share of it, to be honest with you. Uh, but the trick is not to let it dominate and to remember that I also have all of these um, benevolent qualities around me. They're not inside me that I can bring through me. And that helps me to short circuit my sense, uh, my personal sense of uh, my negativity. Mm. Well, I, for Aikido for me is a study of positivity. So I would say, I'm not asking the question, has it kind of been a savior for you then? Because you can't do Aikido with a negative thought in your mind. Well, plenty of people do, Quentin. I think you're being very... <laughs> very I, well, I wouldn't I've define it as Aikido then. Yeah, I've trained for a long time and I've trained with a lot of people all over the world and there's plenty of people who I've experienced do Aikido with negativity. Um, as I say, it wouldn't be Aikido for me if that were the case. Right, right. But they're, they're, they're training the forms, yeah. Um, well, again, um, it's not about me, it's about bringing it through. Yeah. I wanna keep emphasizing that because otherwise it's like, I have to be positive and I have to be happy and joyous. And that's, that's gonna be a hard sell for me. I, I can't, I just, my background and, you know, when I was born, my grandfather delivered me, he was a doctor. So he comes out to the waiting room and he says to my father, good luck with this one. This oh. one really has a temper. And just, you know, from the time I can remember, I was angry and not liking life. Um, so, so it's not about me. It's about what's the universal energy that I can bring through me. And the universal energy, mm. I, I would hesitate to say it's positive, but it has qualities of um, luminescence. And so I can bring that through me but I don't consider myself to be positive or happy. And I don't think that's the goal of Aikido. For me, the goal of Aikido is to become free and not to experience the partners as other, hmm. but free, free from the, the, the duality that they're attacking me. Um, and you know, Sensei just, 
talked about it. He said, they try to attack me, they're attacking the universe. They'd have to break harmony with the universe. He also said a really cool thing, which people don't point to as much, but I try to talk about it a lot. He said, this world is not going well because people make friends with people saying and doing foolish things instead of making friends with, they translated as God, but I know he meant spirit, like Kami spirits. Um, and I love that quote. And I think that is a problem that people put their eggs in the basket of other people and often don't major in universal energy. Right. And take the attitude that the others were just all part of it together rather than I have to make a connection with you, mm. uh, which I think is redundant. Do you think that that links to your love for gardening and horses and llamas and the like? Absolutely. Well, um, they give you feedback, but um, they tend not to be as um, neurotic. Well, no, I, some of my plants are neurotic. I, I, uh, <laughs> and I've definitely met animals that are neurotic, but yes, l l l less so than people. People can be mean spirited, and I don't think plants are mean spirited. The old rose bush that thought differently, but I know what you mean. <laughs> I just got attacked by blackberries. I was handing it, hanging up some fur flags in the trees, not far from where my place is, and the blackberries attacked me, but they were just trying to defend themselves. <laughs> How about we open it up to uh, everybody else now, um, if that's okay with you, Wendy? All okay with me. All right, folks, so uh, you know how it works. Comments, questions, what would you like to, to find out or, or comment on? Paul. Oh. Yeah, do unmute, Paul. Be much better when you do. It's so interesting to hear, Wendy, how we say the same things coming from the same lineage with a very different flavor. It's like cinnamon and <laughs> allspice or something, cinnamon and garlic, whatever. But it's so interesting. Yes, you and I do. We have a, we share a common background. And this is the same with George and Richard, you know, they share that common background and they took it and they each kind of developed their, their lens they look through and we all got our lenses. I can certainly relate to the times you were thinking about the late 60s. I don't remember them, so I must have been there. <laughs> well, I don't remember a lot of them, but some of them. Okay, was there a particular bit, Paul, that uh, you thought, oh, well, that's an interesting way of looking at that? Yes, what was it? The, the, draw, the, the letting things come in from inside. What I've been trying to do is I generate, I do it, but I've been trying to get out of my way and let, it, let myself do it instead of doing it. I think we may be talking about something similar, but a different, different flavor again. Wendy, does that strike you as being possible? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't usually use the term get out of my own way, but I know exactly what you mean. A lot of people use that, that's very common. Um, I mean, scientifically we're made of atoms and atoms are primarily space. So scientifically we're actually porous. We're not as solid as we think. It's just, we've convinced ourselves and our culture has convinced ourselves that we're solid. Um, so, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. The way I phrase it sometimes, mind is primarily physical. The body, however, is primarily mental. I'll let people chew on that for a while. <laughs> yep, we'll do that. Anybody else? I'm looking. You're all stunned into silence. <laughs> Morag. Hi there. Uh, that was really interesting, Wendy. Um, I'm not um, up to date with what your books are. And if I wanted to read one of your books, which one would you recommend I start with? Well, if, if you're looking for more self-development, personal development, The Intuitive Body, my first book. If you want something that's a little more I key emphasizing the practice of freedom. And then the leadership embodiment book is more about leadership, um, how to lead in the world. And then I just wrote a recent one, which is really fun. It's a really little one called Dragons and Power. 
What's that fun about? Yes. Dragons in power? Hmm. Um, well, there's, I have um, six aspects of personal power and six aspects of social power. Hmm. And then they're downsides. So how do you get yourself together? And then how do you be effective out in the world? It's a little small book. You can read it in a day. And it's got some nice um, drawings yeah. and, things and fun things like that. Right. They're all on Amazon. You can download them. You, you mentioned two apps. You said we quote for the sort of Buddhist sayings and you mentioned your own app. Was it the Leadership Embodiment app or was it? Yeah, it's called Leadership Embodiment. They're both 99 cents. And that one's got some centering with my voice coaching you. And you can put a picture there and then there's some stuff you can go in and you can connect to some talks and presentations. And But basically the cool part about that is you can set reminders. So it'll go ping, remember to center. And then since most of us are tied to our devices, when my phone goes off, I just uplift a little bit, open a little bit, invite something that makes me smile because we're trying to get the oxytocin and testosterone going. Testosterone is the expansiveness, chemical, yep. big picture thinking. Mm -hmm. And then we want to have um, some warmth. So the thinking of something that makes us smile releases oxytocin, which makes wow. us feel connected. I can't imagine you're too tied to your devices. Uh, somewhat. I mean, I carry it around and, you know, sometimes it'll ping and I'll ignore it. Um, I don't like every time you know, I don't do that. Um, but it's usually with me. Fair enough. Um, anybody else got a question or, or a comment? Rob. Um, Wendy, thank you for, for doing this. Um, I taking the the world we live in now which for i would suggest that for four years had exactly the worst uh, leadership um my question to you is 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 kind of the politics uh, of this what would you tell a politician who wanted to make an actual difference to do sort of along the line i mean how would how would politicians be better at serving the country and what, I mean, in terms of embodiment practices or what would you recommend if, you know, you had a, if you were, you know, coaching somebody to take over for Diane Feinstein or, or someone as Senator from California to go off into the, you know, into DC and make a difference. Oh God, Robert, that's an intense question. Um, I mean, I just feel for all politicians, I've, that's a place I would not want to be. Um, it's so easy to get corrupted. I, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that drives me nuts about politics is that people don't take the time to really listen, even people that they 100% disagree with and think they're totally wrong. You, people don't take the time to really listen and wonder what's driving them. And I think if there was more willingness, I mean, there's things that people I totally disagree with a hundred percent. And yet I think it's important to listen to what they have to say. And while they're saying it, wonder what's driving that. Mm -hmm. Because that creates a sense of connection and compassion. So you think of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, um, Nelson Mandela, they always included people that were in opposition to them. And I feel like what the politicians need to attempt to be is more inclusive that we can completely disagree, like old school, I'm old, so I grew up old school where politicians would argue and fight and totally disagree, and then they'd go have lunch. Because they recognized that they were humans in it together and they totally disagree ideal ideologically. And then starting with Newt Gingrich, um, you know, people who were in opposition to them with other views became the enemy. They were no longer just people in opposition. So I think, I would encourage politicians to return to the idea that even if you 100% disagree with someone, um, you could still acknowledge they you have a reason. Pass the salt. For, yeah. You they they still, have a reason for their view. They'll a reason. share a table and pass the salt. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what they don't do. It's um, now it's become the other people are an enemy and they're bad, and you actually want to harm them. And that's just the most saddest thing for me. Um, what's happened in politics? Um, and it doesn't mean we don't disagree and we can't be firm about our view and why, but there's so little listening to people in opposition. Everyone's, I hate Trump and he's an asshole and they're all assholes. Well, why? 
Why is he an asshole? Do you know about his family life? Why are they all assholes? What do you think is driving it? What do you think their fear is? And so, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to some of those people and I don't agree with them, but it's really interesting to hear their, their view and why they think that way. They have a view. They're not, you know. No, it's, not it's very Aikido, isn't it? There has to be acceptance of the attack and there has to be empathy in there somewhere. Yeah, and it's like looking at it from their point of view, or Riminage, you know, you're in opposition, you step in, you're suddenly looking at it from that point of view, and you can turn around and say, no, this is my point of view, that's fine. But it just makes me crazy that people um, make these sweeping judgments about people who have different political ideology and, and say really mean-spirited things about them without recognizing they're human beings. And a lot of them, I think, are fear-driven, and they're afraid of loss and whatever their view is, is a feeling that they can be more secure and more safe. I don't agree. I, I, I'm fine, but, you know, but hating them and thinking that they're not worth, you know, listening to is, I, I think, harmful for our political, there is no dialogue for our political situation. <laughs> yeah, I've found no easy answers to how to get things back to civil, to civil. No, I don't, I don't, you know, it's kind of like, it almost has to compost down and then start mm -hmm. up from the place. It's like, I don't think that, you know, these plants can be saved, to be honest with you. I think it just has to all implode and then, but you know, this idea of democracy or people working together is only a few hundred years old. Like we've been tribal for a gazillion years, like separate and tribal and my tribe, your tribe and separate. And so, you know, it's been a wonderful experiment and I appreciate the effort, but you know, it's not, what's natural to human beings is to be tribal and separate and separate out. And that's what's happened more and more and more. We've returned to this very sad separation. And um, I just, I just keep putting as much um, sort of, you know, wishing for as much compassion and love as I can bring through me for all people, you know? Yeah. We have to be the shining lights. We have to be, we can only be our own examples and then other people maybe will follow, who knows. Quentin, you are such a tigger. I'm in ER, you are a super tigger. <laughs> I like being tigger, that's all right. I can be that man. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, know. I, I need tiggers around me because of my <laughs> eerness. Yeah. All right, anybody else got a question or comment? Vitali. Yeah, just... I don't have any questions right now. I'm going to have later on, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the way you were telling us everything you were telling. It was the flow of the conversation was so easy. You were, you were telling about serious things, but it's, it was like a breathe, a fresh breathe for us, which goes through me and stays with me. So thank you so much and for everything you told us and for the way you did that. Thank you. Oh, That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, if you have any questions, you can always just uh, shoot them to me via the Leadership Embodiment website and I'll get back to you and we can have, we can be thinking partners about stuff. <laughs> sure, sure I will. <laughs> thank sure. you. Okay, I'm gonna go, uh, offer one more chance. Anybody else? In which case, I'm going to pass it back to you, Wendy, to see, is there anything that you would like to tell us or a question you would like to ask? Or maybe you could finish with one of those centering exercises. Well, I can do both. And, you know, I think what I would like to invite people is uh, to consider is um, how is it possible to tap more of our universal um, energy? You know, we've all study Aikido. So we, we've read O Sensei's words and you know, he said, I am the universe. And um, that's a big one, but, but, it, but it, it points in a direction. And uh, we have our own personal energy, our little me, our little I, and I want this and I want that. And I'm afraid of this and I'm afraid of that. Um, everyone has that. Uh, in leadership embodiment, we call it our personality. It's a, there's a security strategies, control, approval, safety, trying to get it together. And then we have our universal self, which we call our centered self, um, which organizes itself in the space around us. Um, but that's the sort of leadership embodiment lens. Everybody can have their own lens. I would just invite you to 
to be interested in how you can tap more of that universal self, that universal energy, um, and 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 relate with it more um, in your daily lives, not just on the mat or this or that, but just walking around with it a little bit kind of thing. So that would be my invitation. <clears throat> and then if you get some kind of, oh, the universal energy is like this for me, like I've asked the question, what does key feel like in your body? What's the quality? And when I worked with this in South Africa in the townships, people said things like singing rainbows and warm honey and um, wonderful stuff. Because I think if people relate to the texture and the quality of key, they can um, have more access to the experience of it coming through their body. You know, just what's it like as it flows through? What's the color? What's the texture? What's the quality? And then <clears throat> the centering, um, which I'm happy to um, in, take you through. Um, we think of <clears throat> in leadership embodiment and coming from Aikido, we think of the breath as up and down rather than in and out. So the earth is spinning approximately a thousand miles an hour, which would fling everything off of it. And then we have gravity. And Koichi Tohei Sensei, by the way, was one of the first people that I heard say, what you want, want weight under side is a balance between gravitational and centrifugal force. That's what it actually is. <clears throat> so um, what we do is we use our breath. And as we inhale, I like to think of it as a double helix. There's a spiral going up through my body, up um, toward the heavens. And as I exhale, it comes down from the heavens through my body, spiraling into the earth. So um, when people are attacking me on the mat, I take the attitude they're attacking heaven and earth. I'm concentrating on that spiral. And so I work a lot in Aikido in bringing them into me. Not, not, I don't blend and have them go past me. Um, I think that's easy and it doesn't interest me, but how do you let an attack in? And I'm bringing it into heaven and earth, not to Wendy personally. So the first part of the um, centering is the breath. So we inhale and uplift out the top of our heads. And as we exhale, we breathe down and think of something that makes us smile. Let's do that again. Inhale, lengthen our spine up toward the sky. Exhale, softening our chest, thinking of something that makes us smile. Then once we've got that vertical orientation, then we want to expand. So if we're in a room, we want to expand to the back of the room, to the front, or I like to go outside to the trees, just have a feeling that we all have like a bubble and I'm really expanding my bubble out and everything around is inside my personal space. And then I have a feeling of settling and I wanna be sure I don't collapse, but I wanna soften behind my eyes, soften my jaw, soften my chest, soften my belly. And it's almost like the fountain effect. Meanwhile, there's an upliftedness constantly going through my body toward the sky, and then everything's softening around it, around the outside. And then the last point is um, I asked myself, what would it be like if there was a little more, and you can fill in the blank. Some people use ease, um, gratitude, appreciation. What if there was just a little more? I'm working with equ equanimity this year. We take a quality every year. There's a little more equanimity. And I let myself wonder. So I'll do it one more time. And we'll, we'll go through it with a little more um, clip. Inhale, lengthen, uplift. Exhale, soften. Think of something that makes us smile. Expand out. Lights in the fingertips. Soften the body and think, what would it be like if there was a little more ease? So that's the long version of our centering. And the short version is noble, awesome, shiny, a little more uplift, expand, settle. And then we have a one second version, which we call a lizard push up. I worked with a client. Um, she was a high powered client in an organization. She was always like this and leaning on the table. And the feedback she got is she was aggressive. And she's like, well, I'm just cold. And so I, I took her through this practice and she said, well, I can't sustain it. And I said, well, you don't have to sustain it. You just keep doing these little bursts. And she said, like a lizard push up, and um, in California and up here too, we have lizards and they do this thing when they're establishing their territory. And you can go online and see them doing it to rock music. It's a, we will, we will rock you. And they're so cute. And so we call it a lizard push-up where people just go ding and just 
everything just brightens up and opens up in one second. And people in organizations love the lizard push up. They're just like, oh, lizard push up. And everything moves from this kind of feeling, a little bit heavy to a lighter, brighter in just a second. So you can play with it and add anything you want, but um, I, I do think that we need to cultivate a little more lightness, a little more openness, and a little more warmth um, in our lives on the mat um, and do what we can to, to bring wisdom, power, and courage through us. Well, thank you for creating a few more lizards tonight. It's marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your generosity and time. Really much appreciated. Paul, did you have a last comment? You have to unmute, Paul. I cannot resist because you mentioned lizards. Uh, they know what's coming. You know what the Beatles' first song about a lizard was? No. They want to hold your hand. <laughs> yeah, well, I figured that would be appropriate. That's totally appropriate. That's a, that's an awesome one. You want to hold your hand, yeah. Iguana cool. hold Thanks, Paul. We Thank needed you. that. Yeah. Every okay. session needs to finish on a high. Well done, Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, okay. Wendy. Thank you all. Thank you, Wendy, especially. And um, may your gods go with you, as a famous British comedian used to say over here. Yeah, and may you be lots of noble, awesome, shiny energy coming through all of you. Hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks, thanks for your Thank tigerness you. and, and keep it up. I will. I will. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for channeling your inner tigger tonight, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my practice. My practice is to do that. And then every now and then Eeyore comes in and, you know, my daughter goes, oh, there's Eeyore. I'm like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you did a very good tigger tonight anyway. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.